Fear of change is understandable. It's about the fear of the unknown. In the case of fictional franchises, it's the fear that the character that you grew up with, came to love, might suddenly change and become unrecognizable, or pass under incompetent management. And I'm sure we can all think of infamous examples where the change has been for the way, way worse in the case of fictional media. The entire Doctor Who fan base loses its collective shit every time the lead actor is replaced with another one. The fans swear never to watch the show again, and then sooner or later they come around to it. Except in the case of Jodie Whittaker, because the writing for that season sucks. Based on all this, it's no surprise that the announcement that Spider-Man would be out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and back in the hands of Sony came as a major shock, disappointment, and source of frustration for devoted Marvel fans. Instead of cudgeling the feelings of upset MCU spider stands, I'm going to be laying the record straight as far as the news has come out is concerned. And I'm going to be making the case that this Sony reacquisition of Spider-Man is perhaps the best thing that could happen to the character at this time and place in his storyline. So before you get all mad at me, hear me out. I'm going to make a good case for it. Internet speculation has gone off the rails following this announcement. Many people are wondering, what will become of everyone's favorite affable British man, Tom Holland? Will he continue to play as the character? Well, the answer is a resounding yes. His contract has him on for at least one more solo Spider-Man movie. And that contract carries over, regardless of whether it's Marvel or Sony pulling the strings. Tom Holland himself is very eager to continue playing the character, and I'm sure if Sony has any business sense, they'll let him. Tom Holland isn't alone on this. His co-stars, Jacob Batalon and Zendaya, who play Ned Leeds and MJ respectively, are also signed on for a third movie. The same goes for Marissa Tomei, the actress who plays on May. On top of this, Spider-Man villains that have appeared in the MCU, such as the Vulture, the Shocker, and the Mysterio, among others, are all Sony properties, and they can show up in this next Spider-Man movie, or any future ones made by Sony. People like to talk as though Sony has a bad track record of producing Spider-Man movies. It doesn't. This is a load of crap. As a matter of fact, they've had an overwhelmingly positive track record, producing the Raimi trilogy, as well as the first original Amazing Spider-Man, and Into the Spider-Verse, which were all great. And yes, silly and non-linear as Spider-Man 3 may be, it's still a really good movie. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is definitively the only bad Spider-Man movie Sony has produced. All this being said, here's what I believe is the best next step for Spider-Man as a franchise and as a character. This is all based on the current trajectory of the vision that Amy Pascal, wine aunt and corporate gem, has for Spider-Man. The movie takes place a year after the events of Far From Home. Peter Parker is on the run, and he's accepted a deal from the government to stay in custody in exchange for protection. As part of this deal, Peter would have to give up all advanced technology suits, and he would have to be homeschooled by Aunt May, as attending the school he had previously been at would be too dangerous considering the fact that his secret identity had been exposed and he had been painted as a villain. To the disappointment of his aunt, Peter would sneak out at night to continue fighting crime in his homemade suit, and they would come to blows in a very tense, argumentative scene early on in the first act. While in government custody, Peter would be permitted to talk to his friends Ned and MJ, who would visit him to provide some semblance of normalcy in his confusing new life. These more light-hearted scenes would be in line with the high school comedy tone that was peppered throughout the MCU Spider-Man movies. For instance, Ned would try to help Peter see the brighter side of his arrangement, whereas MJ, the bitter pessimist, would have a cynical retort to everything he would say. During one of his nightly excursions, Peter Parker would have a run-in with Kraven the Hunter, who he would at first see as just an eccentric-looking thug, but would soon prove to be a very formidable enemy. Their fight would end up being carried on into the streets, where it would be picked up by a news helicopter, thus putting Spider-Man back in the public eye. Because of this media mishap, Peter and his aunt would lose the protection of the government, and they'd be back to fending for themselves. Peter and his aunt would then move back to their old apartment that we saw in Civil War. 
There, they would be regarded with suspicion and hostility by their landlord, who, like the rest of the world, still views Spider-Man as a threat. Aunt May would then receive an email from a man named Norman Osborn, who would ask to meet with the both of them to discuss giving them a protection plan. Now I know what you're thinking. Norman Osborn in a Sony Spider-Man movie? Isn't this cliché? However, this movie could maintain MCU continuity by presenting Norman as an inversion of Tony Stark, without using the name Tony Stark. This is because, like Tony, Norman is a weapons developer. However, his secret motive is to keep Spider-Man around so that he can study his powers and figure out how to weaponize them. Peter and his aunt accept Norman's invitation to come and live in Oscorp Tower, where they're given far more lavish amenities than they had gotten at the beginning of the movie. However, Peter is denied a request to be allowed to see Ned or MJ. Peter is also allowed and encouraged by Norman to experiment in his laboratories as part of his education, where he meets and becomes friends with Harry Osborne, Norman's son. Harry admits to Peter that his dad kind of treats him like shit, and we see it play out in a few scenes as well. Despite the vastly improved living conditions, Peter still finds himself incredibly frustrated due to his continued isolation from the outside world. The security systems put in place at Oscorp Tower make it impossible for him to leave. In a character-defining moment, we see that Peter is unable to fall asleep at night, as his spidey sense keeps him awake, alerting him to dangers going on throughout the city, which he's powerless to stop. Meanwhile, we follow Craven the Hunter as he ascends through the ranks of the criminal underworld, and he engages in a ritual to try to enhance his strength. In order to cement his worth as a criminal hunter, Craven vows to be the one to kill Spider-Man. For the first week following Peter Parker's arrival at Oscorp Tower, Norman Osborn isn't around all that much. At a board meeting, Norman tells his shareholders that he's on the brink of an important breakthrough, but he just needs a week to get it all done. This is followed by a pivotal scene in which Norman, Harry, Peter Parker, and Aunt May sit around the dinner table and get into a heated discussion. May asks Norman why he can't use his public influence to vouch for Spider-Man's good name. Norman replies that he'll see what he can do, and then he proceeds to grill Peter about the nature of his powers. Peter firmly tells Mr. Osborn that he refuses to share the secret of his powers to anyone, not even his closest friends. The dinner ends in silence. After this scene, Norman would tell Harry to use Peter's trust in him to acquire the secrets directly. Harry would tell Norman that Peter just wants to see the outside world, but Norman would respond that this wouldn't be possible until he gets the information he needs. Unbeknownst to Norman and Aunt May, Harry and Peter collaborate to design a new suit. Harry shows no sign of sharing Norman's interest in Spidey's power. At this point, it becomes obvious to Norman that he must use more nefarious means to acquire the information that he's seeking. Returning once more to Craven the Hunter, we see him go to Midtown High to interrogate Peter's former principal, asking whether Peter was known to have any close friends. The principal mentions Ned, and Craven sets off to find him. In the event of casting issues, any of Peter Parker's teachers could fulfill the role in this scene. That night, as Peter returns to his room, he's hit by a dart and passes out, awakening in a strange lab. There, Norman tells him that he must take some of Peter's blood in order to study it. Peter realizes immediately what's going on, and he uses his spidey sense to navigate out of the lab. Peter rushes to find his new advanced suit, and he puts it on, using some of its advanced features to take out the security systems and break out of Oscorp Tower. He is pursued by Osborne's security drones in an exhilarating aerial chase sequence. Once safe, Peter calls up Ned and asks him to help him hide. Ned agrees. As soon as Ned hangs up, Craven the Hunter bursts into his room and announces that he will use Ned as bait. In the climactic third act of the film, Spider-Man and Craven the Hunter have a fight throughout the city, and a furious Norman Osborn kicks out Aunt May from Oscorp Tower telling her that she will never be welcome there again. By the end of the film, Craven is behind bars, and Peter and his aunt are back to living in their apartment. Norman is forced to explain to his board why he failed, but he vows to get Spider-Man yet. In a post credit scene, Norman visits Spider-Man's enemies at Rikers, including Craven, the Vulture, and the Scorpion. They, along with Shocker and an unknown sixth villain, are to become the Sinister Six. This sets up a golden opportunity for more Sony-produced sequels starring everyone's favorite Spider-Man cast. 
I think a movie like this would be great to see, and I think it's something that only Sony, independent of the MCU, can do. It also contrasts with Peter's journey in Far From Home, where before he felt rushed into events that he didn't want to be a part of, now he feels stuck, wanting to act, but being unable. This character-driven narrative is the logical next step for what should happen to Spider-Man. I'm also really sick and tired of seeing people suggesting in various comment sections that Disney should buy out Sony in order to solve this problem. As if the monopoly that Disney has over the entertainment industry wasn't bad enough, let's not give them any more ideas. Now I realize many of these people are just little kids who are too young to even know what being laid off means. But still, I do feel like it has to be said. Disney is not the only movie company capable of making good movies. So before we jump to any snap judgments, let's wait and see what Sony has to offer. And then we'll decide.